Um, so it, within module five, we left off with the discussion of Hubble's law, and and that's all, that was on purpose because um, in to, in observing distant galaxies, the Hubble discovered this relationship that uh, when he measured the distances to the distant galaxies and he uh, measured their speeds using the Doppler shift, that uh, there was a clear relationship. Uh, maybe not so clear here, but once uh, you extend out this observation to hundreds of millions of light years, then it becomes clear and this relationship continues to hold to a billion light years and farther away. And um, those distances are determined using type 1a supernovas. So it's, uh, it's quite solid observational evidence that uh, this is a relationship. Uh, and whatever theory we have uh, needed to explain this uh, apparent phenomenon, that the farther away galaxies are, the faster moving they are. And there's an actually quite um, intuitive way you can understand it. You can think of like, um, almost imagine this. Imagine you have uh, some kind of um, thing way out in the space. Um, so, you know, it, so I'm trying to describe this in a way that has nothing to do with the cosmology, which involves gravity and things that are complex. Let's just make things simple. Imagine you have some object way out in space. And since I'm talking about space, <laughs> there are, um, so, so I'm not talking about universe because when you talk about cosmology, the whole thing becomes just a theory of space. So, um, so imagine you have some object somewhere out in the space and there is a, let's say there is a literal explosion. Something, um, something um, takes this ball, breaks it apart. And you can imagine each of these pieces uh, flying away and they will have some different speeds at which they are flying away as some, um, uh, you know, randomly. Some pieces might just uh, by random chance not be moving that fast. Some pieces uh, might be moving uh, much faster than the others by just some random chance. And so imagine that you have as a beginning of something, just an object or distribution of particles. What should uh, expect to find sometime later is a distribution that looks something like this. This piece here that wasn't moving that fast will be somewhere around here. And this piece here that was moving much faster than the others, it'll be way out here. Still moving very much faster than the others. And these other pieces that were moving at moderate speeds, they will be all um, at some distance from the center of the explosion. And when you, so when you just uh, come to this picture and see these objects that are at some distance from others, um, then, then you can kind of imagine doing a reconstruction on this picture. You can, uh, measure the distance from the center of the explosion um, and the ones that are farther away. So all these are, you are looking at them all at the same time. So ones that are farther away, they got to that place that's farther away by moving faster. Ones that are some medium distance away, they got to that place by moving at medium speed. Ones that didn't get far, far away at all, got there, um, got there, um, got there because it wasn't <laughs> moving that, uh, that fast. So this is how you go from Hubble's observation that there is a relationship between the distance to an object to, um, to how fast they are moving, that you go back to the uh, reconstruction that all these, all these pieces they must have come from one place. That if you imagine turning the clock back, that there's a there's a singularity that um, that you can kind of trace all the elements back to. 
Now, uh, in the context of cosmology, it gets uh, more complex than this uh, very simple description because um, in Hubble's law, it's quite uh, different because um, you're not talking about, I mean, so uh, <laughs> you're not talking about uh, some pre-existing background of universe and then a literal explosion happening in one location at the center of universe. And then everything fly on, flying away from that location in the universe. We're not talking about that because um, for one, <laughs> um, the, 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 unlike uh, that uh, explosion of a bomb I was describing, there isn't really a way to separate out the spaces that the galaxies are in the universe from the motion of galaxies. So, so in trying to connect the Hubble's law to a model of the universe, we do have to describe something that is um, not quite familiar in everyday life. But I want you to give you that example of a bomb exploding to give you an example of how one might explain a relationship like this and to give you the, and then to give you the correct explanation of, um, correct explanation within the understanding of general relativity we have. So, um, so there are some figures in the section that we didn't make use of the expanding universe. So this is the textbook section that describes Hubble's law. Uh, well, starts with some other background stuff and then Hubble's law. And uh, this is Hubble's discovery. So, um, so th th there's, I guess, uh, um, so you might have heard of the Big Bang or Big Bang cosmology. The word Big Bang, I'm told, comes from people who or originally thought um, this uh, idea was uh, preposterous, but the universe came from uh, one big bang, one big explosion at the beginning, um, like the bomb that I was describing. Um, so, but somehow the name has stuck and we are still using that. And um, as long as we are using the word the big bang, the thing that's important to understand is that um, in our current understanding of cosmology, general relativity, we are not quite describing an explosion. So the, the figure, your textbook has to illustrate uh, our understanding of expanding universe that's described by Hubble's law is um, this picture here of, well, rulers don't natural expand. <laughs> so this <laughs> example of an expanding loaf of bread. And um, with the loaf of bread, our, um, you know, they don't rise, grow that big. But if you imagine taking that to extreme, like that loaf of bread might have started out like something like almost a little tiny piece that expanded many, many times its original size. And, um, and what this figure is describing as well, if you have imagine features that are embedded into the loaf of bread, like regions, then as this loaf of bread, you would expand the distance between these regions to get larger. And here's the amazing thing. In this uh, expanding universe, it doesn't matter where you are within this bread, uh, whether you are this um, region that's relatively close to center, or you could be this region over here that's uh, in our bread model, <laughs> kind of at the corner of the bread. From your vantage point, you would uh, notice everything else appears to be moving away from you. So, so unlike in that very simplified model of the explosion, where there was one location where explosion occurred and that it's almost what we could have called the center of the explosion. In our model of expanding universe, the expansion is something that happens uniformly throughout the entire universe. There's not one location that you can call center. It's just expanding uniformly. Um, so the bread model is a bit inadequate to describe that because uh, it has a finite boundaries. So you can think about center, 
um, universe as far as we know, you know, doesn't have a finite boundary. So if we universe is infinite, then it doesn't <laughs> um, make sense to try to nail down a particular center, especially in the light of cosmological principle, which says universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Um, if you're talking about the observable universe, that's a phrase we use a lot to describe the universe we can see. Um, Earth is at the center of observable universe by definition, because uh, we observe, as we observe around, we are limited by the amount of time it might have passed since the beginning of universe. And, um, and, and so, so that this, we are limited by, by the time, the distance that we can measure by light, uh, we measure by light years, about 13, 14 light uh, billion light years. And since uh, that uh, measuring of that distance uh, starts from Earth, in that sense, Earth is at the center of the observable universe. But, you know, that's because where the observers are. So, so that's uh, the, um, uh, that would be the place we uh, start from, uh, what we talked about in module five. So, um, so, we, we have this ex apparently expanding universe that results in this observational law. I, I think it might be worthwhile to take a little bit of a step back, um, talk about what uh, kind of cosmology this uh, expanding universe implies. So uh, let me go to the beginning of that uh, discussion of Big Bang cosmology. Um, so if you have an expanding universe, you have a model of how that's happening, then here's something interesting you can do. Here's something interesting you can do whenever you have a mathematical model of something. Um, you can imagine varying the parameters of the model. So, um, yeah, so what I'm gonna talk about kind of relates to here. So, okay, so we are in the universe. We notice that all the galaxies uh, uh, far from us are moving away from us. And we come to this realization, huh, we live in an expanding universe. Then you can imagine that at some earlier time, like a billion years ago, the universe was actually smaller, or I guess uh, in a more uh, accurate sense, the distant galaxies, they were closer to us 1 billion years ago. And um, then another billion years ago, they must have been even closer. Now, as you trace this uh, backward, I hope you come to some realization that um, if you imagine turning back this clock over long enough time, then there's a point at which that even the galaxies that are 5 billion light years away now, that they might have been basically right on top of us at far enough uh, back in time. And how far back in time you would have to go, that would depend on uh, how fast that galaxy, five billion light years away, are currently moving away from us. If we know their speed, then we can kind of, uh, I don't know what the right English word here is. It's, you can extrapolate their position backward until they are on top of Milky Way. And it turns out when you go through the math, it's a relatively simple algebra. Then the amount of time that would be described by that is the uh, reciprocal of the Hubble constant that you have seen. Because the Hubble constant describes the relationship between the speed of the distant galaxies and their distance. And um, assuming Hubble constant is constant <laughs> and that it applies to all the galaxies. If you wait the amount of time, or if you turn back the clock by the amount of time that corresponds to the reciprocal of the Hubble constant, then that's the amount of time when all the distant galaxies will be right on top of us. And, and that's the beginning of universe. And that's uh, um, <laughs> kind of, we, we've gone quite far from, uh, realizing that the universe that we are in is expanding to where uh, you imagine turning the clock back. So you think, okay, universe was smaller at an earlier time. 
it was smaller at even earlier time. It was smaller, smaller. And you might ask this question, where does it stop? I mean, maybe the laws of the universe were quite different back then. Uh, why do we think that um, this shrinking of universe will continue forever? And there's a reason for that. Uh, well, not forever. Actually, this, uh, this is a point of debate and uh, active research on what's happening at the very earliest times of the uh, Big Bang, the, our universe. But at beginning from a few seconds from this uh, start of the singularity, we have a fair amount of confidence that the laws of physics back then are quite similar to the laws of physics that we see now. And uh, with the understanding of laws of physics that we understand now, expanding universe is an actual, um, it's the natural prediction of the general relativity um, of Einstein. 